Blake Scholl is the founder and CEO at Boom Supersonic, taking the time to join us here for a one-on-one -on -one interview in the balcony of the New York Stock Exchange. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a bit of an introduction to Boom Supersonic, who, for anyone who may have only heard of it, but might be a bit unfamiliar with the work you and your team actually do, Blake. Well, this is going to make all of our lives a lot better. We're bringing back supersonic passenger flight. We're doing it in a way that's going to be affordable to a lot more people, and we're doing it on a lot more routes because we've solved the sonic boom. What did the process, the journey, the evolution of the company look like from when it started to where it is today? This is an overnight success 10 years <laughs> in the making. Um, uh, we started in my basement 10 years ago and uh, hired some of the best minds in the industry. And we said there is really no reason why we should have had Concorde and then gone backwards. What we need to do is go forwards and bring supersonic travel back, bring it to more people. And we built the, uh, we built the first ever supersonic jet made outside of a government or military. It was called the XB-1. It broke the sound barrier in January, broke it again in February, and then we broke it permanently because we solved sonic boom. We have a way to do this where there's no boom that reaches the ground. And then 115 days later, President Trump signed an executive order repealing the ban on supersonic flight, which had been around for 52 years. So now all the blockers are removed and we're ready to go. Can we take a look back in the history books? Why was it banned? Just help our viewers better understand the evolution of the of the space and the ecosystem you operate in. What have those last five to six decades or so looked like? Well, ostensibly, it was about sonic booms being a real big problem. And uh, I think it was actually not really about boom. It was actually about blocking the European Concorde project after we'd canceled the American competitor. I think it was the biggest regulatory own goal in history. Because instead of banning bad noises, we banned progress. Literally, you can't go go faster with that 1972 regulation. And, uh, and now that's cleared. Now we can. Now there's going to be a whole new era of innovation. What does easing those pathways of regulation from the Trump administration look like for you and, and the general space? And what do you feel like you and the company can now more firmly do that you could not do previously? Well, previously, we could fly supersonic over water, where the issue of sonic boom was not even a question. Uh, but now uh, there is going to be a noise-based standard for supersonic flight over land. We can do it without any boom which means you can leave New York at 9 a.m. and land in San Francisco at 9.30 a.m. San Francisco time. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. So I think three and a half hours across the country or three and a half hours to Europe. Wow, that sounds really nice. Three and a half hours to Europe. What does boomless cruise mean? Because that's a phrase that I think maybe people with some familiarity to the space have come across. And I don't know if everyone really has the appropriate context. Yeah, so theoretically, sonic boom is this boogeyman. It's the sound that you can make when you go faster than the speed of sound. Particularly if you're at a low altitude, it can be disruptive. But if you're at a high altitude and you run our software, which optimizes flight paths, then the boom makes a big U-turn in the sky. It never touches the ground, so there's nothing to hear. That's awesome. Uh, what most excites you about where the general space is and how you feel Boom Supersonic is uniquely situated for the moment? Well, I think we just have a really crazy history in aerospace, where from the Wright Brothers Ford to the 1950s, early 60s, we made regular progress in speeding up airplanes and bringing air travel to more people, more places. Of course, the jet age made the world more global than it ever had been before. And then we stopped. And we banned progress. And for 50 years, we didn't go forward in aerospace. 1969, we broke the sound barrier on Concorde. Same year, we landed a man on the moon. Fast forward half a century, can't go to the moon, can't fly supersonic. It's time to fix both of those things. And I'm really proud of the progress we've made at Boom. I think it unlocks an entire industry. We're 10 years ahead of anybody else. And the most important thing is we're all going to get to go fly on this thing, which means we can go to Europe the same way we would go across the country today. Blake, what does the relationship look like with the major airlines? We talk about them a lot here in the financial markets. It's, it's the kickoff of earnings season. We've already heard from the Deltas, and we got some other big names coming up. And I think that's the point of entry or recognition from a lot of our viewers in terms of traditional commercial space travel. What does that look like to help them bridge the gap to more deeply understand yeah. your work at Boom? So United has an order in. American has an order in. Japan Airlines has a pre-order. And uh, you look at the, you know, the airline industry, this is an industry that's really where the growth is driven by the quality of the product. And uh, back when airplanes were speeding up, airlines were a high growth industry and got great growth multiples. And what we've seen the last few decades, as we've tailed off on product, the growth has slowed down a lot. So I think what we have here is the chance to really re-accelerate growth and travel. So if you can go to, say, London or Paris or Frankfurt in three and a half hours instead of seven, eight, nine, we're going to go a lot more often. Like you look back at the history of going from the propeller age into the jet age, it wasn't about saving time. It was about opening up possibilities. Hawaii was not a tourist destination before the speed of the jet. Companies like Nike got their start in the 1960s. Why? 
for the first time you could build a global supply chain, you could connect across oceans. And uh, if you think about the jump that we made from propeller airplanes into jets that we didn't make with Concorde because the economics didn't add up in the 1960s, but today they do. So we're going to have a new jet age, a new supersonic age, and it's right around the corner. At least for today, if I want to go to Europe, Blake, it's going to take me seven, eight, nine hours, depending on where I'm going. What does this look like for you in terms of actual iteration, real use case rollout? for passengers to be able to fly the way that you're describing? We're gonna have our first passengers on board in about four years. Uh, we've got the factory up and running in Greensboro, North Carolina. We're gonna be building these by the dozens and then by the hundreds. Uh, and so imagine leaving the East Coast, say in the morning, and being in Europe in time to make an afternoon meeting or a dinner. And if you want, come home that same day, tuck your kids into bed. What do the hurdles, the, the headwinds, so to speak, no pun intended, both for airlines and for the company, actually look like yeah. for you right now? Well, let's talk about what they aren't. It's not that passengers want this. Everybody wants faster flights, so long as they're safe and comfortable and affordable. Uh, airlines want this so long as they can make money. And Overture version one, that's our airliner, will be able to be profitable for airlines at the same price as people already pay in business class today. So that's three quarters less expensive than Concorde. And as we scale, the price is gonna keep coming down. So it's not passengers, it's not airlines. It was regulatory, but now it's not. The last remaining regulatory roadblock is cleared. It's not technology. We've built and flown the first supersonic jet outside of a government or military with airliner technology. So so it's just engineering, it's just a scale up. So we're taking everything we've learned on our test airplane, we're scaling it up, we're starting to stand at production in North Carolina, and uh, pretty soon those first airplanes are gonna roll off the line and I'm really looking forward to being on board. It's easier to ask it than it is to answer it when I talk with the founder and CEO about asking, what does the future hold? Even the next three to five years, Blake, as you know, that is such a difficult timetable to predict. I'm gonna make it a little more hard on you. Give me the next 10 to 20 years, the next decade or so out for where you hope general space travel is and where you think Boom uniquely fits in. Well, I think you actually made the question easier. I think the short term is a lot harder to predict than the long term. And the long term is all driven by fundamentals. And we know what the fundamentals are. We know people want to connect in person. We know that life happens in person much better than it does over a Zoom call, whether it's for personal life or vacation or doing business. When it really matters, you show up in person. And uh, as we break down the barriers to travel, like time, cost, convenience, as those come down, we're gonna see a lot more growth, we're gonna see a lot more travel. And that's the future that I'm really excited to, about. That's the future I'm excited for you know, my kids to grow up in. Blake Scholl, founder and CEO at Boom Supersonic, joining us here from the balcony of the New York Stock Exchange. Congratulations, what a cool space, cool company, really grateful for your time. Thank you so much, Shady.